Today, I want to talk to you about playing the piano with 11 fingers and uh, really taking off from where my previous colleague in, in Bristol ended on is we're very much interested in the neural behavioral constraint of human robot augmentation. So, um, you know, if you think about um, supernumerary approaches, uh, uh, you know, we have, of course, uh, you know, uh, various goddesses and mythologies up to modern mythology and cartoons where we are trying to augment people, but the reality actually uh, looks uh, uh, quite interestingly and also quite interestingly different because in many approaches uh, we are using um, the hands for supporting existing activities. Uh, the supernumeration, you know, holds um, uh, holds something in place as, as an example of, of Asada's work or it helps you grip something better um, or, or just um, gives you sort of some form of static uh, capability. What we're interested in is really understanding uh, coming over from a neuroscience side, what can the brain do and what can the brain not do? So um, technically we are a neurotechnology lab. We are use robotics and machine learning to train our systems, but ultimately we're interested in restoration of movement uh, for people who have uh, paralysis or amputations, but mainly paralysis. And here we're using um, exoskeleton systems that are basically operated. Um, through some form of brain computer interfacing. But what we were interested in here specifically is um, how can or cannot our brain be augmented with devices that um, give, uh, are required to operate on dexterous complex tasks, such as playing the piano uh, with 11 fingers. So in this domain, I'm going to talk basically about this um, uh, robotic uh, system that would have developed this SR3T. I'll go through the, in the details of that in a few seconds, but effectively it simply offers you an additional thumb on the other side. Now, in contrast to, to, to some of the previous works, we're using here um, a very dynamic interface that allows us to uh, actually play the piano with, uh, with an extra thumb. And what we're interested in so far is not so much as building the best possible robotic interface that we can, but to understand to what extent can our brain, our biological capability match our technical capabilities. I give you an example. So you have areas in your brain that are dedicated to individual limbs, to the representations even down to the fingers. And if you lose a limb, uh, then we've seen beautiful work in the domain of invasive brain computer interfaces. You stuck a few electrodes into a monkey or a human brain and you then can decode and then operate some form of robotic endpoint or vector. Now that's interesting, but what happens if you now have an extra arm or an extra finger? Where does your brain control this uh, system and can it control the system while operating the other fingers uh, simultaneously? So what we're taking here is an approach uh, where we're looking basically at, um, at continuous uh, fast movement control. So it's not something you can sort of reason in an abstract sense in some way. So we've looked into that. We also looked at gaze-based interfaces for some form of top-down control. But here we're looking at to what extent can we actually learn to control um, uh, tasks that require, uh, you know, dynamic flexibility. So what you're seeing here, and I apologize for the sound, I'm not sure it's streaming well, um, is our system. Um, it's technically, it's fairly straightforward. It has two degrees of freedom on fast brushless motors. It is basically teleoperated by an IMU that sits on the right foot of the user so as to allow uh, fast readout and uh, of movements. And what you're seeing here is the um, performance of a naive piano player. So this is somebody who knows how to plan the piano after roughly one hour after having been for the first time being fitted uh, with our SR3T system. And what you can see is, um, so initially uh, he used to play uh, with four fingers and the extra thumb. And after roughly 30, 45 minutes, he became confident enough to play it with full 11 finger control. And so basically to evaluate this systematically sort of in a more uh, neuroscience, experimental psychology type systematic manner, uh, we developed an entire protocol where we evaluated, and I'm going to go into the details of that, how good um, uh, the piano player is at using the, in the right hand plus using the left hand's finger to play additional notes versus using the right hand with the robotic thumb. We also then set up that on a digital piano and an input interface that allows people to see uh, what, the, what notes they should play. 
And this is to basically allow us to have both experienced piano players, but also non-experienced, naive people who've never played the piano or know how to read sheet music to be able to perform this experiment. I can tell you a bit more about the design of the robotic system. Uh, we've published this in the past. Um, you know, it has a larger workspace and has sufficient force and velocity to be able to play the piano and generates enough newtons uh, when you need to. So uh, the control of the system, and this is an early version that we photographed here, is it is set by this foot interaction interface. Um, and basically to assess how good people are and how good they can be in learning to operate um, um, the SR3T, the third thumb, we um, develop a protocol where we simply uh, first measure the dexterity of, of controlling uh, the rotation and pronation, supination, uh, sorry, rotation and flexion of the foot. Um, we developed a protocol where we measured the dexterity with which they can use their hands. And we also measured their ability in playing the piano. Um, uh, again, with this visual interface that doesn't require you to have been playing piano before. And out of that, we're basically extracting two numbers. One is what we call the human augmentation um, motor coordination assessment test. It's basically numbers that we're extracting out of these basic features before we fit the thumb. And then we are assessing um, how good you are at playing the piano with, with the thumb or uh, by using uh, your regular extra finger in hand. And that's our measure of task performance. And towards the end, I'm then going to show you um, uh, how, how these basic measures tell us potentially something about how good you're being at being augmented. So, uh, you know, the tasks look very simple. So we have a, a foot balance task. So that's a wee balance board where they, uh, we ask them to control um, uh, basically the, the center location of the, force, uh, of the forces on the foot. This gives us a measure of the accuracy and motor noise that they have in their foot system. Why? Because this is, of course, the interface uh, that we're reading out to control the thumb, um, how systematic and precise they're able at executing um, uh, the movements of the foot, um, because this may be uh, relevant for rhythmic things. And then we're measuring how good they are at tracking uh, this visual feedback that they see on the screen, roughly in the location where their hand would be, uh, with their foot. So we're going up here at the transversal plane uh, with respect to the foot and, and seeing simply how good the human subject with the blue dot can track the red dot on the screen. So that's are the, the foot capabilities. And then we're assessing the capability of, of subjects to use their hands. How dexterous are they, irrespective of the piano playing? Um, so uh, we went wild and went into a, Lugo, into a Lego toy store and, and got a bunch of toys that we asked people to assemble. We used uh, a cyber glove, uh, version three on the right hand to measure the um, kinematics of the hand uh, in, in a number of tasks for the later toy task, as well as assembling um, a toy car with tools. So we collected this data. And in previous work, we had shown various measures of motor coordination complexity and difficulty that we can derive out of these um, high dimensional kinematic time series. So these are the measures that we're applying. Uh, we then went to uh, assess the ability of the person to play piano. So uh, how accurate are they with controlling with their hands uh, specific tempi um, and, and, and simply measure uh, that accuracy that gives us an error measure. And similarly, how accurate are they at a fixed velocity that's reasonably challenging for a non-experienced person uh, to repeatedly hit the correct keys and move between different keys. And finally, we're also looking at how graded they are in basically uh, generating forces on their fingers when they're pressing down and so ask them to define and generate uh, piano keyboard loudness as a defined loudness. So this is, so to speak, our, our test battery. And then um, comes the, the system basically assessed in two ways. So in the one case, uh, we gave them a piano score that we wrote, a, a fairly straightforward one, um, uh, where they basically can play that. Uh, it's a six-fingered score, so you can play that with the right-hand key and then use the left hand to keep over, or you can play these arpeggio tile things with the, uh, with the five fingers that you have, and then with the additional robotic thumb as a difference. And so you see videos of this happening here. You see the robotic system. Um, we have, just for safety, added here effectively rubberized uh, strings that basically take some of the weight off of this interface, uh, so you can do prolonged experiments with subjects if you want to. And so then we defined a metric 
of how accurate piano playing is with respect to the core shown. So we're showing measuring here uh, the note correct hit, the timing correct hit, uh, if you miss notes and so forth, and develop that into a metric. And so now let's look at some of the uh, results that we're seeing here. Um, we took six uh, pianists, uh, all right-handed, and six non-pianists, also all right-handed. So the pianists had reported that they had you know, piano train ex training experience, so they've played for, for, um, uh, for lessons and, and, and significant training uh, in that. And the non-pianists uh, basically confirmed that they never played the piano. Um, and definitely not within the past few years, you know, tinkered around on a keyboard in some way. And so the first interesting thing is that we're finding that in several of these measures, of course, the foot balance is not predictive um, of whether you're naive or a pianist, you know, your foot tracking, uh, there's a weakly significant impact on how accurate they can move their control, the up-down uh, movement of their foot. Um, we're finding that pianists have a higher hand dimensionality what the hand dimensional is that when you're assembling these toys, basically you have a 22 degree of freedom finger model. And then you're asking if I compress this uh, using PCA, uh, basically I get a variance explained curve. And that basically the more PCs have higher loadings, the more complex your movements are. If your movements are very simplistic so that everything can be dis displayed by a single principal component, i.e. Sim a simple uh, open close motion, then you would have the very low complexity. And we're finding that in these toy assembly tasks, all the pianists had a significantly higher complexity. In terms of piano playing, interestingly, uh, both in the positioning of the fingers and the timing of the fingers, we saw no difference between pianists and non-pianists. Uh, and uh, also not significant, although it looks, signif uh, looks a bit higher uh, in the fine control of the loudness. So this tells us that these basic measures are not to a large extent driven by your skill at piano playing, but probably by some uh, innate capabilities that you have. And what I'm showing you here is also the cross-correlation matrix uh, from anti-correlation to correlation, how these different tasks, foot balance, foot tracking, and so forth, are correlated with each other and where we're seeing differences that are significant. Then we looked at the piano uh, playing ability. Uh, and here I hope, yeah, like this, um, that uh, you can see on the left again the score. And then we have this accuracy measure that we have defined. And um, uh, we are plotting here the ability after a fixed number of trials um, in these cohorts to, to play this, uh, to play with the third thumb. That's the, the red trace here. So they're going from accuracy of around 0.6 to a zero accuracy of 0 0.7. While if we ask them to play this piano piece with the left hand that moves then over, uh, we achieve a higher accuracy, 0 0.75 going up to 0 0.9. So within our accuracy score, we can effectively say that the end point here around 0 0.9 is the best that you know experienced piano players with um, a bit of practice can play this piece in terms of accuracy of motor noise and other measures of variability. And we're quite uh, delighted that the robotic augmented um, attempts of these uh, were actually uh, within the same ballpark. Uh, we did not expect that um, uh, they could actually achieve that so high. In fact, we didn't even know whether they actually would be able to play with 11 fingers. So probably that's the more um, uh, fundamental result that we found. And then we went on to try to see how can we predict your performance of playing with the augmented uh, thumb um, from basic measures um, that we have for you uh, from the foot balance, foot tracking, and so forth task. And do we see any differences between uh, your ability to play with the third thumb and your piano skills? So uh, skilled and unskilled is uh, uh, shown here in black with those gray dots for each plot. So I hope you can see my mouse pointer. So the foot balance task um, has an, uh, a measure in arbitrary units that goes from zero to one. And you can see uh, that there's a good correlation between the ability to, uh, to do this we balance board task and, um, and to accurately play this SL3T piano score. And uh, you know, for some measures, the correlation is very strong, such as your ability to control the loudness of the piano is important because it tells us something about how fine controlled your, your force movements are. Interestingly, this is something that we measure in the fingers, not in the feet, uh, and it translates 
um, uh, onto the robotic thumb, although that's controlled by the foot. So I can go more into the details of that. I'm happy to answer questions. I don't want to bore you with tons of plots over plots. I think what now becomes interesting is that we can now start uh, you know, building very simple uh, model fits where we're trying to see um, and this is, you know, we can do this very fancily, but let's try something very simple with linear regression almost. How good can we predict how good you're able to use um, uh, yeah, from your hand scores, how good you are at uh, uh, playing the piano uh, with the third thumb? There's a good correlation here. Uh, I'm showing you effectively the, what we would call the loadings if you do dimensional light reduction. So that's basically simply the regression coefficients. So the piano positioning is very important for that. Um, and we're seeing systematically high scores uh, for the control of the foot, which is not surprising. So if you know how to control your foot well, you control our third thumb very well. And again, interestingly, you see there's no difference really emerging here between the piano players and the non-piano players in playing augmented piano. And I hope this video comes up. So just to, to sum up, we had 12 subjects. They all could to learn to play in the piano with the SR3 thumbs within 30 minutes of training from first fitting. Um, so we find that individual subjects differ in their performance, but the differences are statistically not dependent on peer prior piano playing experience. So it's not the skill in the task for which we augment you, but your basic skill in motor coordination of both the hands and the, thing, and the feet uh, that, uh, that determine that. Um, so, the most relevant skills, perhaps unsurprisingly, is the motor coordination of the control interface limb, so i.e. the foot that controls the thumb. And um, we can a priori predict from these scores very accurately for each individual how good their endpoint performance at being augmented is uh, for uh, this robotic third thumb. So this suggests in some ways um, that there is an innate ability for motor coordination and motor skill um, that implies ultimately if you want to be augmented for a robot um, with a robot with an extra limb that you know some of us may be better skilled at that than others just like some are more uh, have better fine motor skills some are better painting some are better at sports and with this very simple um, uh, motor coordination assessment the, the hamka we, we think we can now start predicting that. So now we're looking also in this, for example, when we're considering working with patients that, for example, stroke and are paralyzed, and we want to restore ability to what extent we can use these very basic measures uh, to predict what's happening. Okay. So ultimately, what we're interested in is find its neuroscientific foundation. So how does your hardware determine how good you can control the robotic hardware, what you can and cannot do? Um, does it, is it even worth say if you're um, a worker who's going to be robotically augmented to send you into training because we can predict something about uh, how good you can be becoming that or more importantly how can we tailor a training program for you that makes you uh, makes it easier for you to learn how to control um, a robotic system so what i should say here very clearly when we talk about um, augmentation the context of what i've talked to here it's not true augmentation from a brain computer uh, interface perspective, it's substitution. We're using the movement of one limb to control another limb. At the level of true augmentation, it's still not clear to me whether we can, for example, retrain parts of our brain and control simultaneously uh, with our brain an additional third arm from the same area with which we're controlling our regular arm. This remains to be determined. But what we've shown in the past is that, for example, using gaze-based interfaces, you can indeed do interactive and competitive use of limbs, such as eating, drinking, and painting at the same time. And of course, um, I had the pleasure to be invited to give a talk, but a lot of the uh, legwork was done by um, uh, my two postdocs, Ali and Shlomi, who I hope are also in this seminar here, and a number of uh, postgraduate students who came through the lab in the last two years. And with that, I'm open for questions.